three, two, one. Welcome to this morning's Middle East Institute's webinar on the broad implications of the U.S. disengagement from Afghanistan. I'm Marvin Weinbaum, Director of Afghanistan and Pakistan Studies, and I'll be moderating our panel discussion. We're all familiar with the fact that the United States signed in late February an agreement with the Afghan Taliban that calls for the American counterinsurgency troop level to drop initially to the current 8,600. And over the course of the next nine months to zero. Unless, of course, there is something of a secret protocol that provides for a counterterrorism force to remain. We're also aware that President Trump is personally anxious to see a more rapid exit of American forces, perhaps to be completed in large measure before November. For much of the American public, a departure comes as a relief after a military commitment in, uh, to Afghanistan that is approaching two decades. But there's a great deal more at stake than simply a timeline. There are implications for other aspects of the American commitment to Afghanistan, and with that, the hopes and aspirations of the Afghan people. There are bound to be consequences for the peace efforts and likely the very course of the conflict with the Taliban. U.S. policy will be directly felt by our NATO allies and possibly affect the international communities long-term backing of Afghanistan. A departure could also leave behind a power vacuum that regional actors, state and non-state, will fill to the detriment of American strategic security interests in the region. Before we begin our discussion, allow me to briefly introduce our exceptionally fine panel. Javed Ahmed, is a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council South Asia Center. He has been a well-known, well-informed commentator on political developments in Afghanistan and has served as an advisor to the Kabul government. Next, Ronald Newman, ambassador to US ambassador to Afghanistan from 2005 to 2007, who has also served as ambassador to Bahrain and Algeria, and Deputy Secretary of State. Uh, Ron is currently president of the American Academy of Diplomacy. Alexander Thier is a senior advisor at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. He was USAID's chief of policy planning from 2013 to 15 and then Executive Director of the Overseas Development Institute in London. Alex is founder and CEO of Triple Helix, a strategic consulting firm. Finally, I'm pleased to welcome Elizabeth Frohkel. Elizabeth is a senior fellow and deputy director of the South Asia program at the Stimson Center. Before Stimson, she served as a Foreign Service Officer with the U.S. Department of State and has been posted in Islamabad and Peshawar, Pakistan. Our discussion, after our discussion, I look forward to taking audience questions through the Zoom's Q&A feature, which you can find on your screen. For those calling in by phone or watching our panel, uh, on, live, on the live stream, uh, you can ask questions by emailing events at mei.edu. And if you have technical issues, again, the same email events at mei.edu. Feel free to raise questions at any time throughout the panel. I will get to as many questions as possible after the panel presentation. And we have um, 
from the beginning here about an hour and a quarter for our session this morning. So panelists, how would you describe the current status of American withdrawal policy from Afghanistan? How much clarity is there at this time? Anyone? Well, I used to do policy, so I'll, I'll kick in. You know, Marvin, when you ask about the clarity of US policy, you remind me years ago in Algeria, I was at a cocktail party and French military attache was there. Several of us were standing around. Somebody asked him, can you describe French policy to Algeria? And he uh, smiled. He took off his kippe, he handed it to one of the guests. He got down on his hands and knees and he kind of groped around with his fingers. And then he got back up and he said, no, can't find it. Uh, and uh, that still reminds me to some extent of where we are today. I mean, in theory, yes, you can describe U.S. policy perfectly clearly. Secretary Pompeo does so. Secretary Esper does so. The trouble is all the doubt about whether people believe it. So in theory, we have a first part of a withdrawal. We have a schedule for a second, which is conditions-based. And the theory of the case is that having agreed to the withdrawal, the Taliban will now begin negotiations with the Afghan government, and that eventually those negotiations will lead to peace. And I certainly hope they do. But first of all, first piece of lack of clarity, there is no public definition of what the conditions are. Uh, you, you can kind of summarize what Pompeo and Esper say about them, which suggests that the violence level is too high. Second piece where lack of clarity comes in is, do we mean it? Even if we know exactly what we mean by conditions. And <clears throat> here we have the debility that throughout the Obama period, so that doesn't sound like I'm only critical of the Trump administration, we repeatedly made claims about how we would have to withdraw if a bilateral security agreement was not signed. And we didn't do it. We also maintained steadily in 2013 and 14 that we our withdrawal of combat forces was conditions-based. And it was very clearly not conditions-based, it was time-driven. Um, so we have a lack of clarity on what the conditions are and a lack of credibility on whether we mean it. And then behind all that, you suddenly have President Trump, you know, tweeting and muttering about whether we should get everybody out. Somebody wants, not my comment, but somebody wants to joke that we live under the tweet of Damocles. Uh, and so, no, there is no clarity. And this prompts everybody else to guess, to make worst case assumptions. And I'll quit talking about that. Okay. Uh any other thoughts, Alex? Well, let me just add, I mean, I, I agree with everything that Ambassador Newman said. I, I think that there is a, an a, a even more fundamental aspect at the heart of the unclarity, which the end of his remarks point to, which is the definition of US national interests and what it is that we want to achieve in Afghanistan, both what it is we want and what we think is actually achievable through our policy mechanisms. And this has frankly been the problem that has plagued uh, 19 years of American intervention in Afghanistan. I was both an outside commentator and then for a number of years sat around the table at the, in the situation room at the White House hearing our arguments about our national interests. Is it about preventing nuclear war between India and Pakistan? Is it about preventing another 9-11? Is it about regional stability? Is it about the millions of Afghans who have or will flee the country in a humanitarian crisis? Is it about democracy and wanting good governance in the region? And all in, in, in many respects, all of those interests are valid, uh, but they do come into competition with each other. And our failure to, to decide what is our national interest and then to construct a coherent policy to achieve that uh, knowing that we can't actually get everything that we want, um, it remains at the heart of the challenge here. And I will just I, I will just throw out for this discussion because I, I think that we are on the precipice of potential major change in Afghanistan. There is hope for a peace process, 
And at the same time, there is the potential that Afghanistan will spin into worse chaos than it has seen in two decades, which is almost unimaginable if you've lived through those two or even four decades. And that fact should clarify our minds. The fact that Afghanistan is at this moment of juncture should clarify our minds about what it is that we want to achieve and what is achievable. And for me, uh, the Afghan people have really suffered for too long. We've just seen what may be the deadliest week in the conflict in 19 years, which is astonishing. Um, and we have to focus on how to make sure that the rights uh, uh, of the Afghan people are respected, that the integrity of the country is respected. Um, and, and that, I think, ultimately is going to be what serves U.S. interests in the long run as well, because chaos would deeply undermine every single one of those interests that I listed. Uh, yes, John. Um, I, I, I fully agree with uh, both Alex and Ambassador Newman. I think it's also fair to say that American national security interests are being redefined, and not just in Afghanistan, but also in, in other places, including in Europe. But specific to Afghanistan, I think the continuing challenge is, um, is that the United States remains undecided about what it really wants to do with the country, despite you know, its stated um, uh, desire for a negotiated settlement. In my view, uh, at the core of this indecisiveness within the US government, or at least within the administration lies a very clear disconnect between what the administration wants and what it could actually achieve. And in line with that, there is also a seeming disconnect between key U.S. government agencies with regards to the expanding threat of a wide variety of jihadist uh, groups that are uh, active and remain active in, in Afghanistan. So on the one hand, these threats um, have been frequently underlined and emphasized by uh, you know, U.S. government's own reports. Uh, um, I'm talking about, you know, State Department's 2019 country terrorism report that was released on, on Wednesday to the recent DOD uh, lead IG report to public testimonies by senior uh, U.S. officials, including most recently by General McKinsey. Um, so, but, so that's on the one hand. But on the other hand, these very threats are ignored, perhaps because it's, it's politically expedient. So, and to me, this shows that the administration has an important internal consensus problem uh, when it comes to Afghanistan, one, but also about the dangers that, you know, uh, this, this sort of complex web of adaptive threats out of Afghanistan really pose to US homeland security. At the same time, I, I, I believe that outside the US government, even though the views about Afghanistan are quite mixed, there are also two opposing camps. One wants to say, hey, pack up and leave. Uh, the other says, no, let's redefine the mission and stay. The problem here is that both camps have not yet succeeded in convincing the other side why their option is better and, and, and both lack alternatives in the event peace negotiations fail or falter. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Last, last thought on this, Elizabeth. Yeah, briefly, Marvin, um, I would echo the, the thoughts of my fellow panelists. Um, I think there are a couple of linked structural issues as well that are valuable to draw out here. So one is the fact that the U.S. was kind of playing the middleman in these negotiations so far. So after years and years of trying to get the Taliban to negotiate directly with the Afghan government, instead, I think rightly in my view, the U.S. decided to sit down at the table directly with the Taliban. Um, and that was the, the February 29th agreement that you referenced. Now, simultaneously, the U.S. also released a joint declara declaration with the Afghan government, um, and those documents are really interesting to read next to each other. Um, so I wrote a piece on this soon after um, both were, were released for lawfare, um, and there are small discrepancies between both of those documents, and I think that's probably inevitable, right? It speaks to um, the different interests of the parties involved, but it does put the U.S. in a challenging situation of being the common party to both agreements. And so we saw this come out in some of the debates that we've seen over prisoner releases, for example, because the language in both of those commitments was quite different. There was, you know, the, the up to 5,000, up to 1,000 language that was in the U.S. Taliban agreement and a much softer pledge of starting conversations about prisoner releases in the US uh, Afghan Joint Declaration. 
And so I think that that structural challenge is going to be something that we're going to continue to see play out and remains a question for me how that will shift if we do see the start of intra-Afghan negotiations. Um, secondly, I would also say to the point about clarity, right, there is a question about how much clarity you need publicly and the value of strategic ambiguity in all of these negotiations. This is a, a refrain that you hear frequently um, in peace negotiations of this type. And I think to Ambassador Newman's point, as violence does unfortunately seem to be increasing in Afghanistan, it becomes difficult to judge whether and how the Taliban are in compliance with the agreement that they signed with the US because many, we understand, of the specifics of their terms were in the classified annexes. Um, that have been reported on, but have not been made public. And so if we were to see this situation continue, um, kind of assessing the question of where those red lines are is difficult, if not impossible, um, without seeing the full text of, of those terms. Coming to those red lines here, uh, can any of you conceive of a development, whether in the United States or, or in Afghanistan or elsewhere, which would change the direction of American policy. Uh, briefly, can you, can you imagine what, what that might be? I don't think that's all that. I mean, the, the particular development may be difficult, but that you can have a sudden reversal in either direction, um, that I think is clear. The, the easiest would be a reversal if we're really pulling out and you suddenly get some disaster, whether it's an attack in the US or something else. Uh, and we, we have a perfect example of that, and that's the fall of Mosul in Iraq. Iraq was off the front pages uh, for the better part of two years. Everybody knew we wanted, we're out, and everybody had a big, not everybody, but a strong element in Congress wanted us out of Afghanistan. And then when Mosul fell, talking to people on the Hill at that time, it was just like an electric current had pulsed through. And it was, an, oh my God, we don't want that to happen in Afghanistan. And it was a huge reversal of opinion. Now that's drained away. But that simply shows that events can reverse what appears to be a kind of inexorable progression. And people ask all the time, how long can you do this? Can you stay? And they they ask that question as though it, there was a finite timeline. It was like a waterfall. When you've proceeded down the river to the waterfall, if you haven't got out of the boat, you go over the waterfall. And in fact, this thing is dynamic. And if it appears you're doing well, people will give you more time. If it appears to be going badly, as it rather does now, people will give you politically less time. And in the case of Afghanistan, this is really up to the president. You know, when, when you stand back, this Afghanistan is not in the top 10 issues of what practically any American is going to vote on. Um, there just isn't that much pressure. This isn't the president, any president's head. It could change. But right now, the president can lead pretty much wherever he wants on this issue. There'd be a lot of grumbling in some cases, but it doesn't mean he can't do it. Whether he can keep doing it, uh, you know, that depends on, on events. Okay. Uh, you know, if I, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Sure. Um, I mean, you know, just like Ambassador Newman said, it's very hard to pinpoint one specific uh, uh, development that could lead to a U.S. policy reversal. But look, every day in Washington is a different day. You know, policy priorities are constantly shifting. You know, what may be a policy priority this week, but the administration may well change next week because, you know, the U.S. decision space is so vast and so unpredictable particularly when it comes to this administration. So, and because of the November election, it's also really, really hard to take politics out of those uh, politically driven issues. I think in the coming months, one option that could, you know, that has a potential to reverse the direction of US policy in Afghanistan is to uh, perhaps bring US troops level uh, down uh, below 5,000, say 4,500 troops by, 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 by this coming fall, which will basically bring the total U.S. force level to nearly half of what it is today. So in practice, what this could mean is that U.S. forces will uh, close down some bases and entrench their presence uh, in possibly 
uh, uh, you know, a handful of bases, mostly uh, in Kabul uh, or around Kabul. So the, in, in the immediate term, this will likely serve President Trump's campaign purpose, especially if there are no U.S. casualties before uh, the November elections. And it could also help push the peace negotiations. But before the U.S. plans to do that, they will need to get something in return for it. Uh, should they um, uh, agree to doing that, perhaps some concrete progress in intra-Afghan negotiations. Okay, you know, uh, uh, I think we, we, uh, we're we probably of similar mind on this and and we're probably also on the possibility of American forces after they have left to be reintroduced. Uh, that also uh, uh, is, is, is certainly gonna be very, very problematic for any administration. Uh, I want to ask you to uh, start with Javid on this because I think he's in the best position. What has the, been the impact on the, on the Afghan people of this decision? Uh, if we can generalize about it, uh, has, it uh, has it affected their, uh, their own faith in their own country uh, and their faith in their future? Well, the... the um... The beauty of the Afghan people is that, you know, the Afghans in Afghanistan in general is a uh, survivalist society. And even though most Afghans today are grateful uh, to American support, they're now becoming somewhat indifferent to uh, America's presence, largely because most Afghans believe that the United States has become increasingly unpredictable. Um, and transactional in their relationship with Afghans. So in reality today, um, Afghans, for, for Afghans at least, uh, the war that's been fought um, post US Taliban deal uh, signing has no legitimacy. Um, uh, and so most Afghans, you know, even though disagreed with the merits of the US Taliban bilateral deal, but they rightly question the sincerity of the Taliban and their sponsors. So the Taliban justification today, for example, for fighting against Afghans is that their jihad, uh, you know, quote unquote, is against both kuffar, uh, which are the, who are the non-believers, and then uh, the monafikin or the hypocrites who uh, merely find spiky. So they have essentially painted Afghans, uh, the nation of Afghanistan uh, uh, as a whole, as monafikin and they have been killing them left and right. So uh, again, uh, you know, every Afghan desire peace, but the prospects of American withdrawal has increased the state of uh, dystopia uh, and, it, it, and so has it increased the sense of fear and despair among Afghans. Um, and this is, again, this is a country that has seen it all. Uh, Alex, we're into a peace process, uh, um, perhaps uh, now to be, uh, uh, to be given some push by a beginning of talks in Doha. Uh, how has this decision, how is it going to weigh in those, in those talks, particularly if they ever get down to the point where they're seriously negotiating? Uh, has the US lost any leverage that it had in being able to influence the course of this? Are we just gonna simply be cheering from the sidelines with it? Please, Alex. Yeah, well, you know, I think it's it's it's, it's very interesting and reflecting on what what Job had said. I mean, there's a there's a tension at the heart of the idea of Afghan peace, which is that the Taliban have for so long said that there can't be peace with foreign troops uh, present in Afghanistan, and in some ways, the U.S. Taliban deal put that on the table in a way that it hasn't been since since 2001. And that's, that's a powerful incentive. It's a powerful incentive, not only for the Taliban, but I think most Afghans foresee or want a future in which they are not dependent on a US security presence, a healthy US diplomatic presence and, and so on, continued security cooperation, but, but not the same type of, of military force. And many of the people I think that we talk to, we've been conducting, I've been doing work with the US Institute of Peace, conducting a series of focus groups with a lot of Afghan leaders thinking about a peace deal, thinking about uh, a political settlement, thinking about a new constitutional arrangement. And 
you know, people really want that next step to happen. Uh, I mean, it may seem obvious to say, but I still think that most people have their heart in the prospect of a peace deal, even if it includes the Taliban, not, not the Taliban taking over, but one that includes the Taliban. I think that, that most of the leaders in Kabul have made their peace with that idea. And so the problem is what would, what would be needed to make that happen where the Taliban are not coming in and believing that they are gonna rule the country and take over because that's unacceptable to most. Um, but that they will actually come in and genuinely be part of a new power sharing arrangement that maintains basic rights and, and democratic freedoms. And that's where the remaining US power, military power, diplomatic power, development power should be focused right now. It should be focused on this idea of getting a deal that is acceptable, that is not anybody's first choice, but that is acceptable to enough Afghans and protects enough of those basic fundamental interests. Yes, we have given up real leverage to do that by everything that we've discussed already, by making the timeline seem inevitable, by making a deal with the Taliban that didn't yet include the Afghan government. So we have lost some leverage, but at the same time, I do think that they have created a scenario in which one could imagine peace moving forward, but it's not going to happen with fecklessness. It's not going to happen with the tweet of Damocles and the president waking up after a bad rally or a bad hamburger and deciding to do something else. It needs a very closely concentrated policy with our allies to achieve that goal using every single resource that we still have on the table. And then it's doubtful, but it could be possible. But without that, um, I think that it is unlikely to, to bring that outcome to fruition, which is clearly the best one, I think, that for most Afghans. And I, I think ultimately what most Afghans would support. Elizabeth, any thoughts on this? No, I, I would echo um, what Alex just mentioned. And it does seem to be um, a window of opportunity at the moment. And it's been interesting to watch, right? over the past 18 months or so, how this process has gone in fits and starts um, and the number of op-eds that have been written writing off the Afghan peace process instead, no progress is being made. Um, and yet we still do see some limited progress, right? March 10th, which was the date that was originally outlined for the start of inter-Afghan negotiations has long since come and gone, um, but that was, from the beginning uh, acknowledged as an aspirational date. And so I think to the extent that people in the Department of State, um, in USAID, in their counterpart organizations across the coalition, in Afghanistan, in the regional um, partners can work quietly to try to insulate the process from some of those potential shocks that could come down the road. Um, it looks like we lost Morgan, but I will carry on in the meantime. Um, you know, that seems to be the best chance that Afghanistan has seen for quite some time in building on this momentum that does exist right now. Um, there are a number of factors that are concerning and I think that need to be factored into that contingency planning process, um, one of which is the, the potential for a precipitous U.S. withdrawal, which I think would be um, a great challenge to the, the negotiating process. But another that we haven't discussed yet this morning is COVID and its impacts in Afghanistan. Um, it's obviously hard to get numbers on this. Um, testing is so limited and unfortunately because of the stigma that's associated with this disease, there's just not widespread uh, reporting or, or even people seeking help in hospitals. Um, but for example, in the Afghan security forces were hearing estimates of between 60 and 90 percent um, of some units that have been impacted by COVID. And you would have to imagine that that is um, a representation of, of what could be going on more broadly across the country. Obviously, Afghanistan is an incredibly resilient place. Um, and, and people that I speak with in the region tend to actually kind of downplay the risk that this could interrupt things badly. Um, but even if not on the Afghan side, you know, what it means for the continued U.S. military presence in Afghanistan, um, if we were to start to see COVID breakout um, and 
interfere in the, the continuing US troop presence before the 14 month timeline runs out. You know, that's an open question as well and something that could be a shock um, to the system and to the slow progress of negotiations, like I was saying. Um, so window of opportunity for now, but also a lot of room for um, crossing our fingers and, and doing some contingent, contingency planning as well to try to insulate the progress that we have seen. Um, Ambassador Newman, maybe uh, I, I'll, I'll pick up on, on Marvin's role for one second and just raise an issue that I know Marvin wanted to talk about that Elizabeth just touched on, and that is what is the likely impact of the withdrawal already and in an ongoing basis um, on the integrity of the Afghan security forces, um, uh, which is both about the will of the, the, the forces, their leadership, but also their capacity to carry on without some of that uh, support that has has been there, um, and particularly with this news of, of COVID affecting so many, is, is there risk of a, of a Afghan military collapse or, or serious deterioration? I think one has to distinguish when you ask about the impact of a US withdrawal, um, three different things. One is force withdrawal alone, but maintain financial support for the Afghan military. Reasonable chance as they have before, that they would continue to fight if the people are getting paid. And that worked for Dodger Bullet time uh, for a while. Uh, not a certainty, but large. Uh, they will hurt if we withdraw air support and particularly contractor support. Although, frankly, my understanding, because contractor support is essential to maintaining the Air Force. Uh, but my understanding is the contractor support is not limited. We don't consider it part of the withdrawal. Uh, so if we continue to pay, they will probably continue to last, albeit with a lot more strain, particularly if they don't have our air support. The, but there's a second point, and that's political. Remember, the, the great victories of Afghanistan have almost never been in climactic battle. They've been when people reach a turning point, where a tipping point, where they say, you know, this, these guys are going to win, and they switch, and that was, you know, that was true all the way from the rebuilding of resistance to the British in 1842 up to the Taliban's march to Kabul, which was much more negotiation than battle. Uh, it was true in 2001. A lot of people just quit, and went back home, uh, and all of a sudden, the hardcore and Al Qaeda were looking around, saying, "Where are our buddies?" Um, so if, if a U.S. withdrawal, and particularly if we cut off the money as well, and the whole sense of the thing is this is sliding and going, then you have the risk of a, a crumbling that becomes part of a political tipping point. And that's simply very, very difficult to predict. So, uh, so I, I, if I could just wrap that up, so I think it is really important that Americans understand that the politics and the military aspects are interlinked. They're not separate. So as long as the Taliban believe we're going, their incentives to have a kind of compromise are very limited. And, you know, we would certainly like the kind of peace that you, Alex, describe. I know of no Taliban statement which actually goes to any kind of willingness to accept that. There's some, there's some nice vague statements that can be interpreted to go that way, and it may yet prove true. Dr. Abella said some good things about flexibility the other day, but there is no actual evidence that the peace we want is achievable. Uh, it, it is the best hope for Afghanistan, but we have to work on the basis that you may not be able to get it. Uh, and so the interrelationship is basically to convince the Taliban um, that they really need to do this. And that requires their belief that we're going to stay. It also, I think one should expect that the Taliban will continue to press militarily because if we don't react sufficiently, it tells the Afghan government, uh, don't trust the Americans, they're on the way out. You better get the best deal you can now. So, we have, I think, a political need to press back periodically, not just proportionally on the Taliban. We need occasionally to strike them when it's not just a defensive action. 
so that there is doubt in their mind about whether they can continue to sort of play inside our decision-making loop. And I, I think this is just a very hard thing for Americans to understand that they want to stop the violence and get the negotiations. I have, we can go on about this, but I have zero belief that the violence will stop and negotiations at the best case will take a long time. And if we are not firm, although very reduced in presence, in that we're not just going to abandon it, we undercut the negotiations. So, John, let me let me turn that to you, uh, Alex. Then, yeah. Let me yeah. let me turn that to you. That I mean, one of the things that the ambassador is pointing out is a is a danger of a of a breakup of the Afghan security forces, presumably along lines that we're all familiar with from the 1990s. Different groups in different parts of the country taking apart. Uh, different different parts of the military. I mean, if the fighting is going to go on for some time, even if there's a peace process, um, and the U.S. Is, is at the level that it's at and potentially likely continuing to withdraw, do you think that the Afghan security forces can maintain uh, momentum and control over the parts of the country that they, that they do control, or do you think that there's a risk of, 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 of fracturing in the near term? Well, so I, I, first of all, like I fully echo what uh, Ambassador uh, Newman just said, uh, but a few points um, uh, in, in general. One is that for several years, the Afghan security forces have been doing a lot more with much less and including, you know, conducting the bulk of the operations independently uh, with occasional U.S. air support, which has been critical. So, but, you know, as Ambassador Newman mentioned, you know, it, the U.S. withdrawal will affect the battlefield effectiveness of the Afghan security forces only if that military withdrawal is simultaneously accompanied by a withdrawal in U.S. economic and financial support to Afghan security institutions. Now, that's because the United States has been a net supplier of security support to Afghanistan. You know, it currently stands up at about uh, maybe $4 billion or $4.2 billion in a year that covers everything from equipment to food to salaries to fuel uh, in weaponry uh, uh, to Afghan forces. So again, the withdrawal of this support, as well as any withdrawal of critical training support to select Afghan units uh, will directly affect some of the key enabling areas that are still being developed, whether that's the Air Force or the Afghan Special Forces. Um, and this will definitely exact a toll on not not just the, uh, the uh, force retention uh, within uh, Afghan forces, but also the combat effectiveness of the Afghan forces itself. The good news is though, uh, that the Afghans uh, are responsible for training conventional forces um, uh, themselves and, uh, so on, like, on the training side. And Afghan forces recruitment has also outpaced its retention rate. So, but you know, one point I really wanna stress here is that retention rates in um, in Afghan forces has improved, but you know one problem with retention rate also concerns the quality of the training. There is a direct correlation between the 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 quality of the training and desertion rates. Whether or not you're forced, you know, when you look at some of the better trained Afghan forces, the retention rate uh, is the highest, you know, and the desertion rate in them is the lowest. The second thing, and this is very important as well, is that. The impact of uh, American withdrawal would also depend on the strength of the Taliban insurgency, which, you know, for now, yes, of course, is operationally quite strong. But barring any any unexpected developments, including COVID-related developments within the Taliban military ranks and you know their rank and file, things are likely to change before November election. So until and beyond November, my guess is that the Taliban will continue to draw their operational strength from their tactical alliances and their transactional partnerships with other jihadi groups. But whether the U.S. withdraws fully or not, it does not affect the Taliban's objective, which is to someday maybe hold the Afghan government at gunpoint. Uh, Elizabeth, do you, do you have any thoughts? And in particular, on, you, you raised the COVID issue. I mean, you know, the, the Taliban and the Afghan military forces for the most part are young men of fighting age, not the people who are most affected. But that doesn't speak to the rest of the country, political leadership, supplies, all of that. Uh, do, do, do you think that that could have a serious impact? And I'm, and I'm also interested what you think about the broader issue of the integrity, uh, both political as well as uh, funding and military of the forces and their ability to withstand another couple of years of this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
On the COVID question, you know, I think, apologies, my dog is uh, getting a little excited in the background here. Um, you know, I think it's really an open question. Um, this is something that, um, unfortunately, it seems like Afghanistan is heading towards, um, could call it a strategy, but probably just a reality of, of trying to get to herd immunity. Um, health systems are not in place such that, you know, any sort of, of containment of the virus seems viable. And how that plays out politically within the country, but just socially within the country um, is, is an open question. And one thing that I will be following is how that impacts Afghanistan-Pakistan relations, uh, because at least in the Eastern part of Afghanistan, um, there is a, a long tradition of people seeking healthcare in Pakistan. So crossing the border um, through Torkham and going to um, get treatment in Peshawar, for example. Um, and the closing of the Duran line border and its continual reopening, that's actually been an, an encouraging sign of uh, thawing in Afghanistan-Pakistan relations. But if things were to get more severe, um, because simultaneously, unfortunately, uh, we're seeing a surge in cases in Pakistan, um, and if that was no longer going to be a possibility, um, that could be a, an additional source of, of tension more broadly and in the bilateral relationship. Um, to your question on continued funding for Afghan security forces and the messages and the leverage that the US is, is able to send with that, I think uh, to Ambassador Newman's point, one of the challenges for the US is, is to simultaneously try to message the Taliban that uh, we mean business and we will hold you to those terms of the agreement and, and the expectations that we have there while simultaneously uh, trying to ensure that Afghan political elites in Kabul do move forward with their side of the peace negotiations. You know, this has been one of the structural tensions, as I was mentioning earlier in this process. And even though we have seen um, the eventual formation of a government, um, the compromise between Fani and Abdullah, um, there's been very slow progress if you look at the number of cabinet ministers, for example, who have been appointed so far. Um, and to the extent that the US is doubling down on the battlefield and, and trying to um, hold the Taliban to account, I worry about the message that that sends about the US sincerity of eventual withdrawal to um, the government and, and Afghan elites in Kabul. And indeed, I, I wonder, and I, I would be curious if other panelists have thoughts on this, um, how seriously the US withdrawal is taken um, as, as a real possibility right now in, in Kabul and in cross Afghanistan, because a number of, of contacts that I speak with regularly in the region doubt that um, when push comes to shove, the U.S. is really heading for the exits. Um, and there are a variety of different logics that are brought forward for that from, you know, the blood and treasure that we've invested, this idea that the U.S. is, is really seeking permanent basing in Afghanistan, which is one of those uh, conspiracy theories that I've heard for a long time, um, to more frequently now with the U.S. setting its sights on China and um, great power competition and confronting those revisionist powers, um, seeing Afghanistan as a geostrategic asset. Um, and so I think I would wonder about just the general skepticism regarding US withdrawal plans and how that factors into the political calculus um, within Kabul, but also within, within Taliban as well. Well, let me, let, let me ask a question before we move. There are some good online questions that we'll move to, but let me ask a question, a quick round of all of you that kind of picks up on the, the opposite of that scenario, because I do think that part of the point of this, uh, this panel is really to talk about the implications of US withdrawal. Um, and, I, and I want to talk a little bit about this really, I think, horrific, but not out of the question scenario that, that many of us have touched on a little bit, which is, which is a collapse. Um, we know that it's not unreasonable to think that if there is a U.S. withdrawal, if it's precipitous or even if it just happens slowly over time without a resolution, that the United States, uh, that, that Afghanistan rather could fall back into a situation with uh, much uh, heavier fighting, uh, perhaps division along old lines, uh, different alliances being made, 
um, a long war to come, which could trigger a uh, massive outpouring again of Afghans, a huge humanitarian crisis, regional instability with what's happening in Kashmir and Iran. And, and uh, so I, I just want you each to talk about what your biggest concern is, because I do think it's important for us to be thinking through that scenario and how dangerous it could potentially be to, to regional and, and international stability, whoever wants to, to go first. But, but let's try to make it short and then we can move to some of the other questions that are coming in online. I can, I, uh, I can speak to it like quickly. Uh, I think it's very easy to predict a, a doom and gloom scenario, uh, you know, from our ivory towers here in Washington and elsewhere. But, you know, I would say my argument would be that a, a, a Syria like situation, Syria like situation or scenario is much less likely. But uh, if, if in the event that the United States does withdraw fully, uh, but still maintain a, a degree of financial and security support to um, Afghan uh, security institution, then we're looking at an Iraq-like scenario. Um, but I think, you know, if, if we are arguing that Afghanistan is going to descend into an actual civil war where there will be small fiefdoms and chiefdoms and everyone is going to levy their own taxes and they're going to have their own small countries, uh, uh, essentially, you know, creating a soft partition of the country in the event of a full U.S. withdrawal, I think that would, again, depend on whether the U.S. military withdrawal is simultaneously accompanied by a U.S. Uh, 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 withdrawal in political and economic financial support to uh, the Afghan state. Um, I would imagine that peace efforts uh, in the event of a withdrawal would sooner or later be pronounced dead, uh, mainly because an important leverage in the form of a U.S. presence will be gone, and the Taliban would be on the offensive to uh, threaten the survival of the Afghan state itself. So in that case, I would assume that the fight and talk strategy on all sides will continue. Uh, the Afghan government is likely then going to abandon the Doha talks, uh, at least in its current format, uh, and they will instead start to reach out to individual Taliban factions, um, possibly even offering individual deals. Um, future U.S. relationship in that uh, um, um, uh, scenario will, will become increasingly transactional. But again, every day in Washington is a, is a different day. So we're talking about full withdrawal today, but it could well change next week because the decision space is so vast and unpredictable. Uh, I, uh, welcome back, back Marvin. Please. Go ahead, Alex. No, I was just going to say welcome back, hey, Marvin. Can you hear me now? We, still... we, had a, we had a power failure here, uh, and, uh, and everything slowed down, and it's taken 15 minutes or more get back, but thank you for carrying on uh, with it. And let me very quickly say, have you touched on the possible implications for the conflict itself? Uh, of, uh, you have, you have uh, good That's on, what we're on talking that. about. Uh, and let me, let me ask this, because, go ahead. Uh, you all had, um, you all had the questions uh, that I was, and were you able to go through most of those questions? We, we talked about the implication on the Afghan security forces. And right now we're talking about the broader implications if there is a collapse, just how bad that could be and, and, and what, how, what impact that would have we're on we're much forces. We're much too long-winded to have gotten through all the questions already. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, but, let me get uh, to the Marvin, final question. We yeah. are, we, Javid has raised a really quick, Alex asked us to wrap around quickly on US withdrawal. And I think Javid made some really good points. If I just sort of summarize, I think we're basically in agreement. Um, the degree of meltdown in Kabul will be heavily influenced by whether you're talking about a total U.S. pullout, including financial, or you're talking about a military pullout, but retaining fairly strong financial support for the Afghan government. Within that context, whatever meltdown there might be is likely to be a somewhat slow process. I don't think any of us are predicting an instant Taliban victory. Uh, and the one thing we have not mentioned, though, is the more things break down, the more it will attract foreign support, China, Russia, Iran, who all have fear. It's more fears than interests. Uh, and, and that those fears will, over time, 
uh, incline them to provide support to various groups in Afghanistan, not necessarily to win. That's an American idea that you provide support to. Their, their support will be to keep them from losing, to prevent other groups from winning, to strengthen the border. So the, it's, it's a complex scenario. It's not a, 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 a two-part or a light switch kind of thing. Uh, let me, let me <laughs> get to the last of the questions that I had, uh, and that is what strategic implications are there for American presence in the region uh, of our reducing to either a very small footprint or, or practically none at all. Uh, we do have... Whoop, well, Russia, China, certainly Pakistan. Have you touched on that in your discussion? We're, you're fading. You're fading in and out, Marvin. But we hope you will stay with us. Yeah, uh, I'm saying, has there been any, has there been any thought here about what the broader implications are in terms of the fact that we have strategic interests in the larger region, particularly given the uh, the competitive relationship that we have with Russia and China, uh, the special relationship in a way that we have with Pakistan. And of course, we know uh, the very poor, poor status of our relationship with Iran. Uh, uh, is there a larger, a larger issue here of whether the United States has to be present in the region and where a disengagement would be detrimental to our interests? Well, some of us believe so. Obviously, these are issues under dispute. Um, it, one of the questioners I noticed asked, did anybody on the panel believe America really ought to stay with a minimal presence? And I will tell you, I do. Uh, and that's a long discussion that we can have some you know, other time. Um, I think you have a kind of spreading circle of consequences to getting out, sort of like a, a rock creating ripples in a pond. So you have the immediate consequences in Afghanistan. You have, I believe, if you move into more of a civil war, the government has more troubles, you have the possibility of a really uncontrolled space, which allows the Islamic State and Al Qaeda both to grow with uncertain consequences, but I believe a threat to the nation. You have a much larger, you have a regional consequence that it pulls others in because they think they have to protect themselves. That makes things messier in Afghanistan. And then you have a kind of larger world consequence, one more evidence that the United States really can't be counted on, uh, that it's fickle. And we've seen this before. I mean, when the Obama administration decided not to go ahead with missile strikes on Syria, whether one thinks that was a good policy or a bad one, it reverberated all the way to, into East Asia, where people were saying, do you now still believe you can count on the US? Um, so I'll quit there. Yeah. Other thoughts uh, on this, Alex? Yeah, well, you know, what? one thing that I would say is that I, I think, unfortunately, that there is a massive asymmetry from the positive benefits of a relatively stable and poor Afghanistan and the negative implications of a destabilized Afghanistan. And obviously we saw those negative implications in the most horrific and dramatic way uh, on 9-11, but that was what we as the US saw before that. There was incredible amounts of suffering, massive displacement in the country, impoverishment of, of one of the poorest countries in the world already. And we've seen that, right? And we know how terrible it is. But unfortunately, largely for most of the last 20 years, there has been a high cost in dollars and in lives uh, for what has happened in Afghanistan. But it has been relatively contained in terms of the regional destabilization uh, potential. And we now have to really think hard not just about the positive consequences of having Afghanistan as a, as a US ally in the region, which does have some value, but the really negative consequences, I, I think as, as Syria has really demonstrated of an implosion uh, and what that can do uh, both to the country itself and regionally. 
Um, unfortunately, I think, you know, what we've seen from the Trump administration is an inability to think strategically um, about US power in a radically and dramatically changing world. Um, we are not in the same world that we were in in 2001 or even in 2010. Um, and so we have to think about US power and our interests and the long term of what regional competition and stability in Asia actually means for the US in economic and security terms. And they've just demonstrated no capacity or willingness to do that. So I'm not confident that they're going to do that, even though obviously they should be, but should be looking at it differently um, than, than in, in past decision making. Couple of thoughts here. Um, what I've mentioned earlier on kind of this, this argumentation around China and if the US leaves, then China's going to fill that vacuum and, and take advantage. Um, I don't really buy that, that reasoning. Um, I don't think that under this new um, great power competition rubric or focus on, on rising powers, um, that Afghanistan is necessarily a compelling story for you know, a, a continuing US presence on those terms. Um, so even if China were to um, you know, really come in where the US to leave, um, China has already been in Afghanistan investing. You know, there are some mining operations that are going on, but I have every confidence that the same governance and security um, corruption challenges would beset those projects just as they have um, what the US has been trying to do. And in fact, what has already happened with the, the work that China has tried to do in Afghanistan. The other thing is that in general, um, the interests of China, of the US, of other regional players within um, a relative range uh, largely overlap. Um, so China doesn't want instability in Afghanistan. And if we were to see some sort of broader outbreak of, of regional conflict or conflict in Afghanistan, then that would certainly um, be something that would get Beijing's attention and then likely pull it um, closer into the mix there. Um, the other thing in terms of, of broader strategic implications that I would point out is the way that Afghanistan and the groups that are based there um, can impact what's going on in Kashmir and crisis dynamics between India and Pakistan. Um, obviously, this was something that we saw um, after the Soviet withdrawal. Um, I don't anticipate that something similar would happen in this case uh, when the US leaves. But nonetheless, the Taliban and in general, um, jihadi forces will gain a a victory here. Um, this is something that's going to be a propaganda victory that could uh, spur on further movements across the region. Um, they will certainly at least try to pitch it in those terms. And also groups like Lashkar-e Taiba that traditionally have a presence in Afghanistan. Um, it's an open question to me what the future of those groups is going to look like under um, a future negotiated agreement or whatever the ultimate um, outcome that we see in Afghanistan is. And then in turn, what that means for stability between India and Pakistan, both of which, of course, um, are nuclear powers. So I think in terms of, of US interest regionally, that has to be high on the list. Can, can I quickly yeah. interject, Marvin? Sure. Uh, I, I, would, I would respectfully disagree with, um, with, with Elizabeth's characterization that Afghanistan is not a compelling story for the United States can, to continue its engagement um, in, in that country. Um, look, you know, despite the U.S. Taliban agreement, um, every country in the region is still hedging in, in Afghanistan in their own way, from Iran to Russia to Pakistan um, uh, and uh, to, 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 to India. We are at a time of great power competition and American, you know, presence, quote unquote, is an important aspect of that great power competition, not American retreat. So the question we should be asking is that how can the United States maintain positional advantage, you know, including the ability and the capability to influence partners and friends and foes alike without some kind of a forward presence, forward maybe military presence in the region. Now, you mentioned Iran in the region. It's, it's already supporting their own Taliban faction, for example. You know, if you read the recent State Department's terrorism report that was issued on Wednesday, Iran is reportedly uh, uh, now 
um, it, it has reportedly allowed an Al Qaeda facilitation network to operate inside Iran. There are Al Qaeda members who reside in the country. They're sending money, their fighters, into Afghanistan and other conflict zones. So um, we should also not ignore two uh, other very important points. One is that terrorism is just like a pandemic, uh, you know, except that maybe there's no vaccine to guard against it for now. But Today, terrorism remains an existential threat to U.S. homeland security. Um, you know, despite you know America's pivot, of course, to this uh, whole great power competition. I would also argue that because the intentions of jihadists in all sort of terror groups with regards to the United States is quite clear, and these groups and individuals, you know, take their objectives, their pledges, their oaths, uh, and their allegiances quite seriously, and they understand very well that you know, reneging on those objectives and purposes would discredit them, not just as individual, but also as organizations. Now, we, we, we can do all sort of technical collection um, there, you know, of intelligence, of information. We could also, you know, do occasional direct action, but that only buys you space. It hardly solves the problem on its own. So, and that's where, you know, U.S. presence on the ground comes into play, however that presence look like, uh, which will definitely affect, uh, 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 U.S. national security. And so one last point, and that is that the Afghan war is no longer America's war because it has now effectively become a gray zone conflict uh, in this whole, you know, a, a, a great power competition. So whether the United States uh, extracts itself militarily from Afghanistan or not, it will still be involved one way or the other there. Okay. Um, we, I should now, uh think that we will want to turn to questions and answers. And uh, we have a number. I don't know that we'll get to all of them. But uh, it has been raised that uh, we've not talked about India. Uh, what, what you're thinking about what India has, what stake India has in, in this American policy. Thoughts? Anyone on this? On India, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. I can jump in. Um, I'm curious for other thoughts as well. Um, India is in a tricky spot, and we've seen that historically, um, Delhi has maintained support of the current constitutional order um, in Afghanistan. They've maintained their contacts with the Afghan government and. It was interesting to see um, Zalmi Khalilzad's trip to Delhi um, and the news reporting that came out of that um, regarding Delhi establishing contacts with, uh, with the Taliban, with the other side. You know, I think this is going to be a very sensitive question going forward. Um, and New Delhi, India has traditionally played a key role in development spending in Afghanistan. Um, and supporting that reconstruction is gonna be central and particularly to the extent that um, funding from the US and other sources might eventually be drying up. You know, at the end of the day, um, it's a major regional player and um, it seems like after having um, not been as included in the process, um, that's, a, that's an issue to watch going forward. Of course, there are sensitivities there um, with neighboring Pakistan and the way that the US and others are able to, to navigate those challenges. Um, at the end of the day, there is a role for India in Afghanistan. Um, and the contours of that role um, and trying to manage those um, given regional sensitivities is going to be a real challenge. Okay. Uh, my, my... Go ahead, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say really quickly, I think my concerns about India are, are twofold, um, which is a problem that's not only India, but all regional players, you know, it's, it's really expensive to buy peace in Afghanistan, and it's really cheap to buy problems. Um, and uh, maybe Afghanistan should, should discount peace and, and raise the cost of its problems, because at the moment, uh, you know, it's, it's, it'll be too easy for Afghan for, for India to interfere in Afghanistan in ways that are, are unhelpful, even if they think it's in, in line with their national security interests. And, you know, it, it obviously, as always, plays into the India-Pakistan dynamic, which is changing in unhelpful ways. Uh, 
I saw a real head slapper this morning that Imran Khan had said that uh, Prime Minister of Pakistan had said that the United States had martyred bin Laden. Yes. Um, and, you know, there, there's just always the worry that Pakistan is going to make the wrong decisions about um, Afghan stability being in their own best interests. And mostly they voted against that, thinking that they could somehow, as people love to say, you know, uh, control the snakes in their backyard and not have them bite them as well. And it has always redounded against Pakistan. And so long as Pakistan continues to play that role of country that a major, you know, significant regional country that is uh, unpredictable, that, that embraces the wrong players, and that's willing to play with fire, um, it, it will push in, in a resurgent, strong, increasingly nationalistic India in a bad direction. Uh, so that's not helpful, but it's what I see. Uh, we've been, um, yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, Iran, uh, one question asks about the prospects that the U.S. and Iran could cooperate on Afghanistan. Uh, is there really any, any possibility of this? Not, Can you hear me? Yeah, not with this administration. The U.S. and Iran have cooperated on, with Iran. Uh, on, on Afghanistan, I mean, uh, Iran was very uh, played a positive role at the Bonn conference. It was reasonably helpful thereafter. I probably had the last conversations with the Iranians in Kabul uh, under UN auspices, and they were very interested in stabilizing the situation there. So, under another administration where we are talking on multiple issues, they could be, they have reason to be helpful. They have other interests as well. Uh, it's not a foregone conclusion, but it is certainly a possibility. With this administration where it's all conflict all the time, uh, no. Yeah, uh, which, which does lead to a question about whether, were there a Biden presidency, uh, anything significant would change? It's really hard to say, you know, Biden wanted out of Afghanistan before. I don't think people should be too optimistic about what a Biden presidency will want. And, and I think Biden had no understanding of Afghans because his great confrontation with Karzai over corruption, Karzai completely misunderstood and thought that it was about our turning hostile to him. And so it completely vitiated the, what Biden was trying to do. But I think Biden is more responsible. And so whatever the policy is, it's likely to be steadier. You know, but in fairness to this administration, by my count, we've had nine policies in Afghanistan. Two, uh, I count two under Bush, five under uh, Obama, and two uh, so far at least under Trump. So our ability to maintain any administration's ability to maintain any policy over time, I think has to be a little bit Questioned. I'm sorry to say something so so cynical, but um, we, you know, I, I think you would have with the Biden, you would still want to be out, the U.S. out, but he would also want to do things more responsibly. He wouldn't be playing crack the whip the way Trump is with policy, uh, and he might be more amenable to some form of longer term support and presence. Question here with do with the U.S. counterterrorism presence, uh, and the, the questioner is is really que questioning whether this is viable or not. Uh, if it were not accompanied by a social and economic support that at least professed to be about, I'm reading the making of the Afghan people better off, is an isolated foreign military presence politically or morally sustainable? I don't think so. Javed can really answer better from the Afghan perspective, but I believe if you have a military presence that only serves our interests and is only killing, that it is not sustainable. Uh, and it also, it's kind of a Washington fantasy because when you actually think about it, who's gonna secure the perimeter? Who's gonna secure your larger interests? Um, 
you know, who's going to secure your logistics routes. So it, unless you have a tiny little presence uh, that, that's hidden someplace, uh, you know, it, it isn't really just there because you, you got all sorts of other issues. Javi. Yeah, I, 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 I agree with uh, Ambassador Newman, this one. So at the moment, if you look at a United States Afghan strategy, it has been, I would say, threefold. Um, there's a counterterrorism mission. There's a train advise uh, and assist mission of the Afghan security forces. Um, and then there's also a, uh, a concurrent uh, uh, supporting and enabling of a friendly government, uh, uh, Afghan government in Kabul, uh, which has you know, essentially allowed international forces, including um, uh, the United States to operate uh, from Afghan soil. Now, if we're looking at uh, US's future in Afghanistan, the question would be, can a future government say, or just let's assume one that's led by the Taliban, uh, provide these kind of concessions. And I think uh, the answer is, considering the US-Taliban agreement, uh, or the terms of the US-Taliban agreement, and, and the Taliban's long-held uh, objectives to extricate the United States from Afghanistan, the answer would be no, right? So my, um, I would assume that in the future, uh, there will be uh, the, the U.S.'s CT presence would involve both regular and irregular forces, mainly uh, militias such as the host protection force or other counterterrorism pursuit teams like the kind of hard strike group, and possibly you know they will create new structures uh, within you know their intelligence rubric. Uh, their formal uh, in Afghan intelligence units, uh, special units that the, the the 010203304 units, um, uh, they're likely going to be using and exploiting more of those, um, uh, which currently operates uh, under US's budget and outside the Afghan um, uh, government's uh, jurisdiction. But the question would be uh, what, what that redefined mission would actually look like and what the, uh, the United States um, would like to ultimately achieve. Uh, and, and I think there is no clarity on that one for now. Least. Elizabeth, any thoughts here? Um, a little bit more broadly, uh, Jonathan Schroden actually had a, a good piece on this recently, but thinking through um, what a continued diplomatic and development presence will require in Afghanistan in terms of personnel protection, um, private security contractors, that sort of thing. You know, I think there is um, in both the, the U.S. Taliban agreement and the, the joint declaration with the Afghan government, um, the U.S. committed to seek further funding um, for those objectives to work with Afghanistan on reconstruction. Um, and that requires in every instance that I've seen, having people there on the ground able to get out um, and some of these scenarios that we've thought through with a very, very limited presence, or if unfortunately um, wider scale conflict were gonna break out, that would be increasingly difficult to do. Um, and so I think uh, my understanding of, of the proposals as they stand is that the US does intend to maintain a, a strong diplomatic presence, use economic leverage, um, continue participating in reconstruction. And those are all, quite frankly, to my mind, levers that are more capable of um, getting some of the political objectives that are in US national interests than necessarily um, a continued military presence. But um, the need to protect our personnel and ensure that they are able to operate um, is an open question and, and one that will be difficult going forward. And of course, the, the basic question here is whether any of those activities are going to be possible if we don't have a military presence. That's really the, uh, there are some who believe, and, I'm, and I, may, uh, I may be among them, that the departure of the United States, whether it's materially or psychologically, is going to have a game-changing impact. Uh, uh, one, would, one would hope that uh, the Afghan security forces will step up, but on the other hand, there are forces pulling on them, I think, particularly uh, with 
the absence of a foreign forces presence. So uh, we, we're going to have to wind this up now. Uh, I think we've uh, raised some lots of questions. Uh, we've got a great deal to anticipate over the next few months now. Uh, and I want to thank the panelists for, I think, elucidating so many of these issues so, so much in depth, so carefully. Uh, and thank our listening audience, our viewing audience, for bearing with us, particularly with me in, in our technical difficulties uh, this morning. But again, once again, thank you to all of you. And uh, we'll be seeing you again, I'm sure, uh, before too long uh, to follow up on many of the, the uh, points that were made during this morning's discussion. Goodbye now, everyone. Bye -bye. Thank you, Marvin.